Hi, happy holy. <laughs> I, um, I know it's a day late. I had fun with that yesterday. Um, a GitLab reseller of ours, Lyra, was kind enough to um, take me into their office and let me uh, experience the uh, holy festival with them. So um, I'm happy to be here from GitLab. Whoops wrong direction. <laughs> and um, I'm going to be talking about how to secure your Kubernetes clusters. But I also want to make sure to, to talk more broadly about cloud security in general, because Kubernetes is a piece of that. But if you're not looking at the overall picture, you won't be secure and manage your risk. And I really believe that we're into a new era where security is going to be much more of a software-defined environment. And I'll explain a little bit about why that is. But you can imagine um, applications in general are becoming um, almost a network unto themselves. So you've got um, pods and clusters, and everything's talking to each other within an environment. Uh, it's very, very different than the traditional um, on-premise environment where it's much more about protecting the perimeter. So as an application moves around from cloud to cloud, that security needs to follow it. And so it's a different mindset and a different approach. And along with that, some of the key trends that um, come to bear, you know, everyone wants to shift left and recognizes that it's far less expensive to identify vulnerabilities and remediate them early in the life cycle. But that's easier said than done. Um, there's been a tendency to take security tools and toss them over to developers and say, okay, now you need to use this tool. And developers don't want to be security uh, professionals. And so really the key is enabling development to create secure code. And one of the key challenges is you have this very iterative process for development followed by what historically has been more of a waterfall process at the end for securing, you know, security gates that you have to get past. And those two things conflict. And so what has to happen is that security needs to be built into that iterative development process so that it's congruent with that. Um, serverless cloud Kubernetes, they all represent additional attack surfaces, and I'm going to show you some of that here shortly, and that's something to think about. And then the fact that um, you want to be agnostic and be able to move your applications from one cloud to another and one environment to another, as I said, really creates a different mindset for how you need to think about your security. And it comes down to zero trust, but zero trust has been around for a long time. It's been a hot topic, though, recently. Uh, it was started by Forrester, and now Gartner and others are talking about it, which kind of tells you that it's becoming a little bit more mainstream. And the premise is that there's not a perimeter to protect, that the bad guys are going to get in. So you need to look at the security of your data and your applications, assuming that the bad guys are going to get into your, to your network and, and uh, get exposed. Um, microservices is another really important piece, as well as APIs and dependencies. So you've got, um, there's a reluctance, I think, um, in some to worry about scanning uh, for vulnerabilities and dependencies because there's the thought that, well, so many people are using open source that surely it's secure. Um, and that's really not the case. That's, that's um, one of the weakest links because um, if a bad guy can get a vulnerability into an open source um, component that's used by lots and lots of companies, they've just broadened their scope and their reach. So um, it, it's a very vulnerable area. And microservices, when you think about breaking down a monolithic application into many more applications, that sort of breaks a traditional application security approach where you're scanning your application, usually sometime in a test environment, um, and you're getting charged by the application. Now, if I, I 
talked to a customer on Monday and they were taking a monolithic application and breaking it into 42. Well, that just increased their security cost by 42 times. So you've got to think about this a little bit differently. Now, cloud requires a shared accountability. And I created this slide to show not definitive roles and responsibilities, but more of uh, primary roles and responsibilities. So the cloud providers doing some of this, security vendors are doing some, and the cloud providers are starting to do more. I don't know if you saw uh, a couple weeks ago at RSA in, in California, Microsoft and Google both announced more or less SIM um, capabilities, and so uh, security information and event management capabilities. So the, the landscape here is changing, and when I ran this by our infrastructure people, they said, you know, we really deal with something in every box here. So, you know, take this with a grain of salt, but um, in terms of primary responsibilities, it, it's a shared environment. Now, when you take the application layer and you wrapper that in containers and you wrapper that in orchestration, it increases your attack surface. So now you need to think in the container space, you need to think about the images, about the registry, and about the east-west traffic. And that's, that's the, the way that the applications within the containers communicate back and forth. Um, from an orchestration standpoint, authentication and access is really key. So what Liz showed around role-based access, that's really, really important in, uh, in the Kubernetes space, and as well as network policies. And you saw some of that. And it's really um, kind of the Wild West right now in terms of setting those policies. There are some best practices, but it's still, I think, very early as an industry. We're kind of in a learning mode there. So I want to show you, I, I attended a demonstration of a Kubernetes attack at RSA a couple weeks ago. And actually, Liz, her demonstration was very, very similar to what, uh, what these folks showed. And I want to give credit here to Jay Beal of InGuardians. They were the ones that did this. They're a pen testing company. And the biggest takeaway I had from that was if your pen testers aren't doing some of what, what he's doing and looking at containers and Kubernetes, <laughs> you're, you're missing out on, on uh, some big areas. But what he showed was he went in through, I think it was a WordPress application, um, a dependency, a vulnerability in a, in a dependency there, and it allowed remote code execution, which then allowed him to move from one pod to another until he was able to find a pod that could talk to the API server. And once he could do that, then he could ask for the AWS credentials and get it to ultimately to the secrets and control the, the cloud environment. So. Um, Again, it kind of goes back to the weak link, uh, which oftentimes is the open source dependency. So you want to make sure that you're scanning those. Now, in terms of Kubernetes threats, um, the new stack has a good ebook here. Um, GitLab is all about reusing things when we can and giving credit where it's due. So um, this is a, a really good ebook. We have nothing to do with it, but uh, the information was really helpful in terms of looking at the different threats and uh, ways of preventing that. And again, it comes back to authentication, to not relying on the defaults. In fact, um, back here, one of the things that I missed, key point is 90% of, of the, the preventative measures here have to do with configuration. And configuration is very challenging right now. Um, but, but that is, it's very important as well. And in fact, there's a Center for Internet Security has a benchmark. And this, I'm told, is one of the best places if you want to do your own configuration. If, 
I think if it were me, I'd want to hire somebody like Karthik to, <laughs> to help me. <laughs> no. <laughs> but um, if, you, if you're taking the do-it-yourself approach, this was a little hard to find, by the way, so I started. It's under virtualization platforms and cloud because there's, the benchmarks are vast and there's lots of information here. But I would encourage you to, to think about which um, settings you need to, to make in order to really be secure because a lot of the default settings are not the most secure. Uh, so that you really have to think through all of those. Which brings me to um, the, the broader picture of cloud computing and securing cloud. I would argue that there's three key principles going forward. I want to give you some thoughts on, on um, where I think this, is, this space is going to go, so that if you're looking for where to, um, you know, what tools to invest in, who to follow, that sort of thing, we'll give you some direction and some ideas there. So number one, security needs to be an outcome, not a department. Now, the CISO at, v at VMware, at, um, he was on stage at RSA as a keynote, and I love this quote. He said, your most important security product won't be a security product. And we've seen that with 451 also. Uh, they're an analyst company, and they really felt like um, there's the, the new direction is that securing your applications is going to come from a combination of your cloud provider and more likely your software development lifecycle tools. So you're going to embed security into your development process and that's the way that it's going to be successful. So key principle number two would be breadth before depth. So if you're focusing, for instance, only on Kubernetes security, you're missing the container side of things, you're missing the dependency vulnerabilities, you're missing um, a lot of other elements. If you are doing um, vulnerability scanning, and let's say you're only doing SAST, or you're only doing DAS, so static or dynamic testing, um, and you're going really deep on particular applications, you may be leaving the window open here in terms of um, additional applications that are your weak link in the back door. And so you can't think about just mission critical apps because remember, I can laterally traverse and go from one application to another. And so you need to think through um, those kinds of permissions. So when you're thinking through your, your Kubernetes settings, uh, for instance, uh, if I have an application for HR, probably shouldn't be talking to my point of sale application. So those are the kinds of, of uh, settings that you can, you can make in Kubernetes. But um, you want to make sure that you're thinking broadly. Now one way to think broadly would be to test every line of code. The traditional application security approach would be I'm going to test my mission critical applications and I'm going to do it uh, again sort of near the end of my development life cycle and I'm going to go really, really deep. But the problem with that is then I've got to get that information back from security over to development and prioritize and chase down those vulnerabilities and get them, get them triaged. If you can do all of these tests, so static, dynamic, dependency scanning, container scanning, and license management, all right within your um, pipeline when you commit your code, then you're taking that broad approach of testing everything. You know, another a good analogy to that would be when you go to the um, airport and everybody gets scanned, right? If you have a ticket and you're going in, you're gonna have to, you know, stand in the machine and, and get scanned. All of your bags get scanned. Now some get pulled aside for a more thorough scan, um, but they're scanning everything at least, at, you know, at least at some level. So you should think through application security testing in a similar way. I would encourage you to scan everything all the time, even if it's not a super, super deep scan and then save those super deep scans for, uh, uh, for special circumstances. 
What this allows you to do then by, by scanning everything when you commit your code is have much faster cycle time. So we talked about the clash between the iterative development process and the security at the end. Well, the way to resolve it is if you're testing everything every time you commit your code, then the developer's getting information back. So I write this code, I commit it, here's the vulnerabilities that it created. So I've removed all of that friction in the process where things get, happen, you know, the testing happens later and comes back maybe a week later and you have to track down what line of code was it that caused the problem, you know, where was it that, that um, I need to go to fix this. So if you're doing it more iteratively in smaller bytes, the other advantage to that is my scans take less time because I'm doing it for whatever code change I make, not the whole thing. Um, and, and it can just be much more efficient and effective. So then what goes on to your security department are those things that you, the developer's not able to resolve. So maybe you're not sure if there's a compensating control, so you're not sure if you should dismiss this you know, vulnerability or not, or um, you're not sure of the best way to resolve it or it's going to take a long time and really need to be prioritized, so you want to create an issue for that later. Um, all of that can be done most easily if you're using one tool that offers the end-to-end -end from uh, the code repository to CICD to security. Now the last point that, uh, in terms of key um, directions for the new IT and securing the new IT is that simplicity and integration will always win. Uh, I like to use the analogy between your cell phone and your camera. Um, and you know, Another one would be your microwave, how many buttons you have on your microwave and you usually just use the one minute one, right? Or the popcorn maybe. Um, for the, the cell phone, you know, you, there are times when you want to use your camera because you want all the special settings and the special lighting and what have you, but the downside of it is when you think about it, it's not integrated with anything. You know, with GitLab, we're all remote and we have an employee meetup for uh, globally every nine or ten months, and we were in South Africa in August. And I took my digital camera because I thought, I'm going to get these spectacular pictures. But in the end, I realized I don't want the pictures to just stay on my phone. I want to share them. And so I have my cell phone with me all the time. I don't necessarily always have my camera. You know, with the separate camera, you've got to make sure it's charged. You've got to make sure it's got storage. I take the picture, it's good enough with my phone, and immediately I can upload it to Facebook or text it to my kids or whatever. And it's that integration that is so, so important. So when you think about um, having one application across the entire software development lifecycle, that simplicity and that integration is really something that can add value that you can't get when you're stitching together a, uh, a DevOps tool chain. The other element of that is kind of a single source of truth. And so everybody's looking at the same thing, dev, sec, ops. I think in the end, the sec of dev, sec, ops is going to disappear. If we're all successful, sec will become ubiquitous and just built into dev and ops. So I hope those are um, good thoughts for you, and uh, I know I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch, so I appreciate your, your attention and your patience. Thank you so much.